Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Crime Family. We're very excited that you're joining us for part two of our discussion of the Adnan Syed case. And if you listened to our episode last week, you'll know that we're very interested and also very frustrated by this case. Uh, There's a lot to dissect, and you'll know that our discussion was just getting started. In part two of our discussion, we do talk a little bit about things like the facts cover sheet, which is a huge piece of evidence that was never brought up in trial that we believe could have led to Adnan being acquitted. We'll also talk a little bit about Don, who was Hay's boyfriend at the time of her murder, and why we believe that he should have been given a second look and some of the suspicious things surrounding his involvement. And I'll also read an excerpt from Rabia Chowdhury's book that may cause you to think about this case in an entirely new way. So thank you for joining us. Let's get started. Okay, so yeah, like this, them not knowing if there's payphones in the Best Buy parking lot, I, that's like another thing that like nobody's following up on. I feel like somebody has to know, like talk to a longtime manager or employee, talk to like the phone company, like you, did anybody have a phone booth at this location at this time? Like somebody has to know something, but nobody looks further into it. It's it's just frustrating. No, it's like the, the same thing we keep coming back to. It's like nobody knows anything. Like it's like the most unreliable people ever, like. You can't get anyone who's actually reliable or remembers anything that's... And then, like, they're so easily being like, well, no, it could have been a different day or it could have been that day. Like, no one knows anything. Yeah, like, the more we talk about it, yeah, it's just like people think they know, but actually know they're wrong. And I don't know, and nobody's able to figure out what the actual truth is. So it's kind of a little bit crazy, actually. Yeah, and also in that talk that I... The video I watched of the, like, uh, the speech that Rabia gave... um, She says that if you actually look at like case files from other cases in that area around the same time, the same cops that did this case, like McGillivary and Ritz, like those are the two main cops that like do the interviews with Jay. Like they're also involved in other cases that have also been looked at as like wrongful conviction cases. So this is their like career, like fraudsters or something like at this point, like it's like, I don't know. It's like there's other cases that point that are very similar that like they're just not doing their job or they're focusing too much on one person yeah that's just really sketchy like like for those for those other cases to be be like that and now like they're just doing the exactly same thing here and it's just like when when will it end when will they get caught or when someone needs to step up and be like these guys are a piece of shit and they don't know what they're talking about yeah and i think it looks good for know the cops when they have a high arrest rate because it's like oh they're doing their job really well but i think it i think it was a documentary or something i was watching the mayor or somebody was saying like the higher the arrest rate like the lower the conviction rate kind of goes down because you arrest all these people but then there's nothing to back it up so it's just like this it's not it doesn't balance out if that's your motive just like to arrest everybody it's like you actually have to have reasons i wanted to talk a little bit about the The facts cover sheet that is mentioned a lot in the documentary and also in the Undisclosed podcast and Rabia's book, um, which is, I think, one of the most, which is one of the most glaring pieces of evidence that was misconstrued or not used correctly to to push their narrative. So, the when they went to subpoena the the, the cell phone record from AT and T for that day in January to see like what his cell phone activity was, they. Um, when AT&T sent the records to them, they also had like a cover sheet at the top of the fax. Yeah, so the fax cover sheet that was provided or at the top of the, the fax said that outgoing calls only are reliable for location purposes. Any incoming calls will not be considered reliable information for location. So basically that tells you that a lot of anything that they're using in the case about 
incoming calls, so any incoming calls that come in, like it's saying that those are not reliable for location. So when they're trying to like track the the cell phone tower pings based on like a call that's incoming, it's basically that says it's not reliable. But the entire prosecution's case rides on the fact that these cell phone these incoming calls came in at this time. Like the two thirty six call that came in from the Best Buy parking lot, that's not reliable for location. So when Jay says that he was at this person's house at the time that that call came in, and then you hear other other people he was with saying no he wasn't here he wasn't here like obviously no one knows where he was because it doesn't match with any of that but like the prosecution didn't share this with the witness from AT&T who testified at the trial about the cell phone records and the prosecution didn't even show him the fax cover sheet that said all of this stuff which how much of an expert is he if he doesn't even know this but they didn't even they didn't even show him or tell him about the fact that so that's a huge Brady violation because it's just like covering evidence so basically the prosecution saw that all these incoming calls were not going to be reliable, but they basically ignored it and didn't tell their key witness and obviously didn't tell the court. So all that testimony that they gave about all those incoming calls was not reliable. And so they, so they uncovered this fax cover sheet like later on, like Susan Simpson re- recovered that like when they were doing the Undisclosed podcast. It, I think it's kind of like the one thing that's clear, blatant, like hiding of evidence. Shady. Yeah, like this is huge. Like, there's like hours and hours of like podcasts and like part of the documentary where they talk about these like phone pings in these towers. And it's just like basically what the prosecution is going off of for their case. And yeah, it's like they're picking and choosing what to present, which obviously they're allowed to do to pick out evidence. But at this one piece of evidence, that just be like them only talking, like whiting out certain phone calls that don't align. Right. And they're only talking about these like that's like, yeah, it's like super important to the case. And super shady and definitely illegal. And it's crazy that they're just getting away with all these little things. Yeah. And like I said before, like, I can't believe because it's always you got to always have the prosecution who like will push the envelope and try to get away with as much as they can. But it's up to like the defense attorney to also do their job properly, do what's best for their client. And like this stupid lawyer, like (laughs) Christina Gutierrez, like she was totally incompetent and that's something that she should have actually, she will, should have went through that whole entire fax. She should have saw the fax cover sheet. Like if she had seen that, she could have presented that at trial and be like, these incoming calls are not reliable. And that's like the basis of their whole case. Like that case closed. If a jury saw that, then it would have been over. But she didn't do that. She neglected to do that. Did she even look at it? Like, was she just taking their word? Like, this is what, this is the calls that came in and went out. And she's like, okay, I can't dispute that. So, you know, that's just, it is what it is. Or did she... Did she not look at it or did she not care or did she just miss it? Like, I don't know. I don't know, like, what it was. I think it was, like, like you said before, she could have just been totally going for that appeal money, thinking that she was just going to get pick up the appeal and get all that extra money. So maybe she just totally didn't care. But I have a, I don't know, and if that's true, that's horrible. And like we said, she ended up getting disbarred, actually, years later because, actually, not even that much longer later. I think it was like just a few years after this case that she was disbarred because, People had complained and then she was, I don't know, it was just a whole thing. But basically she was incompetent and she ended up losing her license over it. Not this case, but like other incidents. But I mean, just just to be fair for her, like she was really ill toward the end of this and she was in the hospital and she was still taking on these full caseloads. So maybe she was just take, trying to take on too much. You know, she maybe she was on medications. She was obviously super stressed and sick. That I feel like definitely had like a big role to play in this, but... It's still, she still should have like maybe backed off and not taken on so much or given it to somebody else that could have handled it rather than just, you know, totally botch it. Yeah, like, I don't know if she was just in denial about how sick she was, which is possible. And like, I do have sympathy for that. But also like, this guy's been in jail for 22 years because of her incompetence. So I can't have that much sympathy for her because look at what he's had to deal with. Yeah, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say like, maybe even if she was sick or she took on too much too fast. But there was somebody's life at stake. Like, you can't just mess with that. She should have just done her job properly and we wouldn't have been talking about this today. Well, yeah, she was like a really smart lawyer. So obviously she should have recognized the fact that she wasn't representing him properly. That was That's definitely on her. That's why the, the family hired her as his defense attorney because she was pretty, like, well-known. She was well-respected at that time. So obviously, like, she has had other cases where she's been like good but i don't know she just really dropped the ball in this case but all of this stuff like was stuff that wasn't even being like wasn't known at the time obviously and it's like all in retrospect and just so frustrating it's like if someone had caught some of these things like during the time of the trial like it, the result could have been so much different 
Yeah, it's so easy for us to sit here and like, you know, like pick apart everything and say she did a really shitty job. But of course, we're looking back and somebody else has done all the work for us. And we're just like looking at it. And like back then, obviously, it was very, very different. And when you're in the midst of it, it's a lot harder. It's just so like, I feel like a case is won or lost in like the attorney that you have many times. I don't know. I just try. I keep going back to. I was actually thinking a lot about like cases where people had gotten acquitted when like there was so much evidence to show that they clearly did it. And it's like the Casey Anthony trial, like I feel like it's so obvious that she did it. And she was someone who was acquitted on like, but when you go back to her defense attorney, like he was a really good attorney and like obviously created all this reasonable doubt and like brought up all of these things that made the jury acquit her. But like, you know, if you have a really good attorney, you can get off. And I just think like here there was barely any evidence to go on and they convict like what's the like what's the difference between like what Casey Anthony's like a white girl she got off when there was so much stuff like that showed that she was guilty and like in this case there's like almost nothing to show that he was guilty and he ends up going to pr- life Casey Anthony life. yeah K- Casey Anthony was like a white girl from Florida so like there's your <laughs> yeah and Adnan is like a 17 year old Muslim kid from Baltimore yeah so I, don't know, I was going back to her having too much of the caseload to deal with or like just too much to handle she should have just got help she should have asked somebody else to either step in or help her out if she felt overwhelmed because clearly she did a shitty job and now he's sitting in jail for something he didn't do all because she didn't do her job properly maybe like maybe it has something to do with like her style as well like people said her style was kind of like dragging things out to the point of like monotony where like the the person being questioned would finally just like kind of give in and just because he's so annoyed or he's so exhausted from the questions that he just kind of says things that he wouldn't normally mean just to get it over with. And even just listening to some of like her talking, uh, I don't know. I'm just like, if that was me, like I can only listen to her for like maybe two minutes. And I'm just like, holy God, just like stop talking. Like just like just the tone of her voice and the way she talks about things and like how she like, drags things out. And like, I don't know, that's just annoying. And maybe that's just her style that just kind of rubbed everybody the wrong way in this in this case. In the documentary and stuff, they talk about there was actually a mistrial. Like the first version of this trial was happening and like it only was on for like, I think, a week or something. And then there was like an aside between like the judge and the two attorneys and the jury overheard her being called a liar, saying that she was a liar. Um, And then once the jury heard that, like they had to like dismiss the case or they had to like do a mistrial because now that the jury's going to think that's in their mind that she's a liar, they're not going to believe a single thing she says. The crazy thing about that, though, is like, and they talked to some of the jurors after and they actually were saying that most of them were going towards um, acquittal. So she was actually doing, I guess this is like, yeah, not following up my point at all, but she was actually doing a really good job because most of them were leading towards an acquittal. And then they had they did a mistrial and had to get a new jury. And then it went downhill from there. And then she did a shitty job on the other actual trial that... Yeah, maybe she just put so much effort in the first time and she just didn't have it in her to do it again. And she just, like, fucked it up. Well, I would have, like, fired her and gotten a new attorney for that second trial. Like, she's being they, called a liar. Maybe they knew that... They but I guess if she was doing a really good job in that first time. First one, time, like, yeah. yeah. Like she was getting an acquittal the first time. So they're like, okay, she obviously did something really well. Let's keep going. But it didn't happen again. And it's just, like, so frustrating, too. That, like, all of this, it's, like, just... It's so much that's out of his own control. Like, he's... You know, yeah, his family hired that lawyer, but, like, he's only 17. Like, I'm sure he doesn't know anything about, like, the justice system. Like, he's just going through the motions and, like, just to see him, like, basically be railroaded like this. The entire system just completely failed him, I feel like, in every aspect. Can you imagine just sitting there and listening to, like, Jay especially just, like, talk shit the whole time? Like, none of these things that you're saying are matching up. And, like, if everything he's saying is made up and Adnan just has to sit there and listen, like, it's unbelievable to think that he can't get up there and defend himself. Or, like, he doesn't, like, burst out in court and be like, what the fuck? Like, I feel like I would stand up and be like, you're completely lying. Like, you're lying, you're lying. But he doesn't do that. He's completely calm the whole time. Like, I can't imagine going through that. Yeah, like the like the restraint that he shows during that time to just sit there and listen to all that bullshit is just crazy. Yeah, for like days and days on end. Like, yeah, listening to Jay and, and even in interviews after Adnan's like, I have no idea like why Jay is saying any of this. And like, when you think of it on the surface, it's like, why the fuck would Jay like just like basically implicate himself as an accessory to murder and marrying this girl that never happened? Like you think like, why would you ever go to the police and say that you were involved in burying a body that didn't 
but that's not true. But then when you when you go back to like all the things that they were going to pin it on him and all the stuff, like obviously that makes sense. But for Adnan, he was super confused the whole time. He's like, I have no idea why Jay is saying this. Like we weren't even. Where is this coming from? Like, it's just so... To think what he must have been thinking that whole time, like, obviously he wouldn't have known at that time, like, the intricacies of what the police did, but he must have thought, like, this Jay guy is, like, They were kind of... They were kind of... They kind of mentioned that in the documentary, like, if you're going to, like, kill somebody, you want somebody to help you, you're going to, like, have, like, your best friend or, like, somebody you know really well to help you out, because you know they will. Not some random person you hang out once in a while. With. Yeah, and people even said that Jay was kind of that person for some people. And I, again, trying to track, I don't even know what version of Jay's story this was, but it was a version at one point. He said that, like, Adnan had asked Jay to, like, secure, like, a bunch of weed for him. And then once Jay provided him with the weed, then he's like, okay, now you're going to help me bury this body or I'm going to go to the police and say that you just sold me all these drugs. And, like, Jay was saying that I felt, like, coerced into helping him bury the body because he was going to turn me in. And like, I don't know at what point the story came up, but like, like I said, it's tracking his stories is an impossible task that I'm not going to even attempt. But another version of Jay's story was that um, he said that Adnan would said that if he didn't help him or if he told anyone that, you know, the same thing would happen to Stephanie, Jay's girlfriend. So it's like, he's threatening him. He's saying he's threatening him with these various things at different times. So it's just another thing that doesn't add up. And also Adnan pointed out himself that even after Jay after he allegedly said that to Jay, that, like, Jay let Adnan hang out with Stephanie alone. Like, he wasn't worried about them hanging out, even though he had threatened to kill her. So, I don't know. It, it It's it's just so crazy. They were really close friends. Yeah, so. like, Stephanie and Adnan were really close. That's why Adnan said that he gave Jay his car so that Jay could go buy her. Like, that shows you what, what a boyfriend. Jay didn't even get her, get her a birthday gift. But, like, Adnan's like, go take my car. Like, buy her something. Because, like, yeah, that was his he was friend. Gonna, yeah, he would have felt bad if... um if Jay didn't get Stephanie a birthday present because he knew that Stephanie was looking forward to getting a birthday present from Jay. So Adnan's like, get her something. So I feel like Adnan was just like, I don't know. He was being a good friend. He was, t- and he didn't even really know Jay. And he was saying. Well, yeah. Well, and I just feel like, well, I just feel like there's so many, like, I don't, to my knowledge, all the stuff that I've read and listened to, like, I don't think there's any accounts of like Adnan being like, a bad per like he was well liked in school he had a lot of friends he was kind of like the jock he was like on the football team like he was popular and like he was kind of like that stoner kid but he also fit in with like a bunch of different groups so like i don't really hear there's not like this narrative of he was being this like creepy ex-boyfriend that was so angry that hey had moved on or everything that you hear about him is good no one says that he's violent ever towards anybody like he's never has like an outburst you know you never hear him anybody saying that he like even yells at anybody like he's just not that kind of person yeah and he had like he had like a part-time job as like an emt at one point like and he was like in the process of getting like writing all these college acceptance letters and stuff like that like i don't know like obviously people can snap and like you never just because like they have all of these like good stories doesn't mean anything but like it just makes it even more sad because i feel i'm like so 100 percent certain that he's innocent so like when you're like prom you, or po- prom king wasn't he <clears throat> yeah he and hay were like or wasn't i think it was like hey. a year it wasn't it was stephanie it was him and stephanie yeah oh yeah that part of the documentary was so sad too like and i don't know just it's just like, like it just makes me so angry it's like this like he kept the secret from his mom because like his mom didn't didn't agree with the prom dating and the dancing and stuff like that so his life was really like secretly see like a, like a secret because his parents didn't really know what was going like really well, yeah well wasn't there like i think like the major incident that en- led to their breakup was that there was like an incident at one of the dances or the school dances where like the pa- his, his parents mom showed up or something yeah. and was super angry and like that was when hey realized like okay we can't really yeah, his together. brother his brother said that his father didn't believe that he was dating because he was getting such good grades and he was such a good student that there's no way he could be doing all this other stuff on the side. So he went to the dance and saw them together and basically pulled them out of the dance. And then that's when they like kind of led to their breakup. I definitely recommend everyone watches the documentary. It's um it's on HBO. It's called The Case Against Adnan Syed. It's a four part documentary, but I don't know, like that first episode where they're talking about like how they were dating and like that whole like prom king. I don't know. It just makes me feel so bad. It's like this like little innocent little kid, like seventeen years old, who like just seems like he has so much going for him and just got completely screwed. I also don't understand. Like I feel bad for Hayes family too because their daughter is never coming back, and like where it's Adnan, he could be getting out of jail and he gets to go back to his family but on the other hand like they just accepted that he did it 
Yeah, like, I think they're pretty adamant that he did do it. Cause... Yeah, and I'm just, like, just because of everything that's been thrown thrown at him and, like, all the stuff that... Like, and honestly, too, like, they're going to be, like, there for the trial and stuff. So they're only going to hear what's presented in trial. Like, mm-hmm. it's probably too traumatic for them. They're not going to, like, spend years of their life, like, digging up all this stuff about the case. Like, they're going to just have faith in the justice system that, like, all this stuff is, like, pans out. But so obviously it makes sense that they would believe that he's guilty, but... It's just so crazy. There's all these, like, little things. Well, they're not little things. But they're, like, the cell phone records and all of, like, Ch- Jay's changing stories and all that stuff that, like, makes it seem, points to that he's innocent. But there's no smoking gun. Like, there's not one thing that, like, DNA evidence that, like, points to someone else. So it's just, like, still that constant mystery. Because, it, I mean, it is still a mystery. Like, I know he didn't do it, but I don't know who did. Yeah, and I think this, and going back to, like, how good of a person Adnan like seems to be they go into like a lot of Hayes diary and how she's writing about how much she loves him and their time together and that's like a super like intimate place to you know talk about your feelings so I feel like if he was like you know like being shady or controlling or like abusive that's like a place where she would might say stuff like that but she all she has to say is like good things about him and like love for him so that was another place that that might show up if it happened but like not, it just there's no evidence of anything like that in Adnan's character at all and like and you know like Hay was like a super smart girl right so it's just, it's not like she f- fell for something that she shouldn't have so it's yeah it's really sad and even and even when like I think we talked about this a little bit before even when Adnan and Don had met like when Hay was meeting Don was dating Don like like Don would have major reasons to like be Adnan's stupid and crazy like this ex-boyfriend like you know he would feel threatened by him or something right so he would have reason to like say all these nasty things but he doesn't even say nasty things he's like no he was cool when we met like it was cordial it was fine and and like i said before like the prosecutors were yelling at don at one point because he wasn't saying that adnan was creepy and he wasn't falling for that trap that they were trying to get him to like paint this creepy picture of him he was like no adnan was not any of those things so like even if don is not saying that when like he would have reason to do that it's i don't know telling you'd think don would have this prejudice against adnan from the get-go before he even meets him right because he's an ex-boyfriend you just automatically have this feeling of oh you know what a loser but he like liked adnan like they could have been friends so that just shows you like how like likable adnan was yeah and like he even said i'm pretty sure it was serial where they mentioned that don had said yeah like if i had went to his high school or if i was the same age as him like i would have hung out with him like we probably would have been friends if even Don isn't saying that about Adnan, like, it's not, I don't know, it's just always so, so sad. It's like this person who, I don't know. And like, you get, as crazy as it is, like, you have to think about how it must be for him, like, to have this stuff coming completely out of thin air. Like, all of a sudden he's woken up in his bed at 5 a.m., like, dragged out of the house, like, arrested, and then never leaves prison after that. It must be like, what the fuck is happening right now? Like, it's just so crazy. I don't know. He was just like, he like just... He, yeah, like, he was, like, just treated like, like dirt basically like no one really like seemed to like besides his def- like his family and his defense lawyer at the time but nobody really seemed to care nobody like oh like he did it well i don't think his defense attorney cared either no but there's nobody else like nobody else did it like we're not pointing at anybody out this poor 17 year old kid was like what the hell happened and it just makes it like i don't know it makes it kind of scary like just think how easily that could happen to someone mm-hmm like, look how easy it was to do it to him. Like, all they have to do is go to someone and be like, we have this dirt on you, so, like, do what we want, or we're gonna, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's so unethical, yeah, like, but... Yeah, like, in a it's either you or him situation, like, you're gonna look out for yourself. Most people are going to, re- you know, regardless of the situation. So, it, it could happen to anybody. So, I guess now we might as well just talk about Don a little bit, because we haven't really talked about him too much, but he's kind of... I don't know. And, like, obviously there's no evidence really pointing to him. Just as, like, there's no evidence pointing to Adnan, there's equally no evidence to point to Don. But I don't know. He's definitely worth mentioning. Um, Katie, do you want to mention, I think, like, you probably can tell it better about the the time card situation. So, like, some of the sketchy things surrounding Don is, like, he worked at Lens Crafters with, with Hay and the day that she goes missing, there's some sketchy things going on with like his time card and when he punched in. Apparently, he he was working at a time when he sh- wouldn't normally be working, like he got called in. And then in the documentary, they talked to like the manager of one of the stores and saying there's no reason for him to be called in at that time because the person he would have been replacing was there as well. So there was like two people on one shift. 
um, which shouldn't have happened because it doesn't make sense. And so they're saying, what was it like his his number or something wasn't like the right number? I forget how that exactly happened. Well, like it was something about he didn't use his own time card to punch in the number because every employee had like. I guess when you punch in your time card, it like shows up whatever your ID number, employee ID number was. And the one, like his number was consistently always the same, except that one time on that one day when he punched in, it was like a different number. Like it was like someone else had done it or something, something like that. Right. Yeah. So someone his else was a manager, right? Yeah. Somebody, somebody else had punched in the, like a different number that was supposed to be for him. And it turned out the person who approved that was the manager, which happened to be his mother, um, so she was, it was like he, she was covering for him and people say that maybe he didn't bring this up because you're actually not supposed to, like your mother not supposed to be your manager, like that kind of thing. You're not supposed to have that kind of dynamic at work. So they're breaking that rule. So maybe they would have gotten in trouble. Um, so there's just some sketchy things surrounding that. But like, but when you look at it, like Adnan's alibi is more solid than Don's. <laughs> like when you look at like, you know, he's in the library with Asia McLean and like he's at the mosque at 8 PM. Like none of that fits with the prosecution's theory. So you know, I think his alibi is probably more believable than Don's, which is like kind of sketchy at best. Yeah, like his mom, like forging his time card for him. Like that's his alibi. Like, oh, that doesn't look very good at all. I'm like, yeah, why? Like, that's like, solid. Yeah, like that's like the only day that ever happened. And like, why? It's, yeah. Well, yeah, like it, of all the days that he worked there, it's like that one day it just happened to be like the one time that his another, like it's just, oh, I'm, like, I'm, suppo- I'm like, supposed to believe that coincidence, but I can't believe like the other coincidence, like, you know? If- if Don wasn't at work, like, where was he? Like, if he's not supposed to be, I mean... With hay. No, if he's not supposed to be at work... No, allegedly, then, I can't say. Then why was he at work? Or was he really at work at all? That's he the thing, wasn't. he... Yeah, like, it's sketchy, like, he wasn't actually at work, but... They made it try and look like he was at work. But, like, they did talk to him on the night of, right? Like, they called Don when she was first missing. And they also called Adnan both of them but like don had said that yeah because he, he, she was with him the night before like she was with him like most of the day of, on the 12th um and then he said that that was the last was time he saw her him, right she was no going to no 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 after she no picked up her cousins at daycare oh well i don't know i don't i don't think they ever confirmed that but she was supposed to pick up her cousin at like three from like daycare or whatever and i don't really know but no because she said that she had something to do at the school that night like there was another there was like a game going on that she had to be i don't know yeah, she she was the manager of um, one of the football oh, the teams or something. Team. Yeah, the wrestling team. Yeah. yeah. So she was supposed to go because somebody else was like she had to go train somebody else. But back to Don, like he originally said the police had called him at like six o'clock and he was talking to them around six o'clock. But when they interviewed the cop, when the cop was in court, he said he actually didn't get a hold of Don until two in the morning. So that timeline doesn't add up. Another thing that's sketchy. Yeah, that's true. But he wouldn't have been working until two in the morning. No, but he like, I think he said he was like talking to the cops around six because that makes it like kind of like he couldn't have been the person that did this because why would he be talking to the cops at home if he was involved in all of this? But he actually wasn't talking to the cops at six. He was out. They couldn't get a hold of him until two in the morning. So he was out doing other stuff this whole time, allegedly. Yeah. And like they do interview him in the documentary. Um, And I don't know. I don't really think... Like, obviously, he doesn't give any new information. He basically just says, like, if people don't want to believe my alibi, well, then they don't have to believe my alibi. But, like, I know it's true, and that's what it is. So, I don't know. I just think he's definitely, like, I can't go, go so far as saying, like, I think he's guilty, but he's at least, I feel like, definitely someone who should maybe look into. But, like I said, they had tunnel vision. Like, after they got that anonymous phone call, then they never looked back, and it didn't really matter what anyone else said or did. It wasn't going to... Somebody knows something, and it needs to be out, and somebody needs to come forward and fucking tell the truth well the person who did it knows they did it i know I'll tell you that that's what i'm saying the crazy thing is like what they talk about in that documentary like how dangerous um baltimore or is it baltimore city is like it's like a super dangerous place and there's like homicides all over the place left and right every day and then like they don't even consider that it could have been like somebody random like they don't like look into that kind of thing right like it could have been hey was in the wrong place at the wrong time you know met somebody talked to somebody that she shouldn't have and something went down I don't know, you know, maybe or, like, it, there's no, there's no evidence that she was involved in drugs or anything, but maybe, I don't know, she just came across just somebody. Say, it could have been a drug thing, like Adnan or like Jay owed somebody money for drugs and. But she wasn't with Adnan at the time. So like, why would, but I mean, I guess if they knew that he was still really close to her. Yeah. Like, and then like, like, why not take her out 
and then but then they they would have they would have told somebody they would have or, told or maybe like oh yeah she was going to meet with someone to pick up some drugs for like jay or adnan or somebody yeah. you know just like as a favor like you know i have my car i'm gonna be out and then you know just came across somebody that she shouldn't have yeah yeah and also too like she always because this is back when they had pagers but she always had a pager on her they never found her pager so they think that whoever did it like got rid of the pager because whoever had paged whatever the pa- last page was like whoever that person was like could have possibly been the one who did it and then they got rid of the pager because that would lead right back to them yeah and also um some people say that adnan had asked her for a ride or something or somebody had asked her to do something and she said no i have some somewhere else i have to go like right after school and she like apparently like rushed away so she was it was like she was meeting somebody or she had somewhere to be on this deadline so maybe someone did page her maybe it was something sketchy she didn't want people to know about it y- yeah yeah, like because all they could say was like she had said that she had something to do, but she was never so specific about what it was. So no one knew what she was actually going to do. But like she had that hour between when she had to pick up her cousin from when she left school. So like she was obviously murdered in that one hour or shortly thereafter. So it's like just so frustrating that she just didn't say like a name of who she was meeting with or like, was it Don? Like, was she going to meet up with Don? And then, you know, I don't know. It's just and also it's another thing too where like no one can get their facts straight about like people said that they thought that they saw Adnan get into the car with her and like they thought that but then Adnan, then other people were like oh no like she told me that she wasn't give, I don't know like it's this whole thing of like he said she said no one really knows what they saw on that day yeah a couple people said that they did hear Adnan say that he was getting a ride with her or that Hay had said that she was going to give Adnan a ride but then other people said they didn't see that some people said they did see it like nobody knows what day what happened so I mean you're it, it really is unreliable to ask some random teenager what happened on any day because they don't know shit they don't remember and it's like it's because like if if it's not a significant event like you know who does remember and the beginning of serial that's kind of what she points out is like nobody really remembers these insignificant things in your life and it just makes things worse to say that you do remember and say stuff. yeah like it's, it's only true. like it's only significant in hindsight but at the time like you're not thinking like oh i better remember that like she said she was going to give him a ride like that's going to be important in like three years from now no one's thinking that like it's just like kind of a comment that's made that like you forget probably 10 minutes after you make it and maybe Better. someone maybe someone was trying to like steal Hayes' car or something and then like she put up a fight and they they killed her and then like hide hijacked her car like that's exactly what happened right they saw that her car was, looked like it had been hot wired maybe that was somebody's motive and she just put up a fight rather than let it go basically all they know is that she was the way she was killed was man- manual strangulation and they know that she was killed well i mean do they even know that she was killed on that day? Like, I mean, I guess they must know because otherwise, obviously, well, guess she didn't pick up. She didn't pick up her cousin from school, so obviously, she was killed. Yeah, I think that. that's the basis for that because she like did that often and she was super responsible about that. So her her not showing up, it was probably because of that. Yeah, she might not have been killed on that day though. Like, she could have been like kidnapped and then killed. But yeah, whoever did it, though, had her that afternoon. Like, it wasn't yeah. like, it wasn't, she went missing and then somebody else came along. It was like, whoever did it, did it at that time before she had to pick up her cousin. We just don't know. Like, it's just, it's just frustrating. It's like it happened in that one hour window of time. We could just like, ugh. It's crazy. It happened in the Best Buy parking lot. Like, was there nobody else, like, wandering around or, like, looking around? Like, people are so fucking oblivious. Like, they don't see someone getting strangled in a car in the fucking parking lot. Like, I don't and know. Not, it's only, just not only getting strangled in the car, but then him carrying her dead body to the back, to the trunk I of know. the car. And putting it I in. Know. Like, no one sees anything broad daylight, 3 p.m. What? <laughs> And then they said, oh, yeah, it's like a big parking lot. And like they could have like went to the far corner where like it's kind of far off. But like still no surveillance video of the Best Buy parking lot. Nothing. No one saw any like, I don't know, maybe no one saw anything because it didn't happen at the Best Buy parking lot. I don't know. They did say that like Hay and Adnan used to go to the Best Buy parking lot to like have sex in her car. So maybe that they did know like a spot where people didn't really go often because if they could get away with that, then obviously, I don't know. But like. But I don't think, like, I don't even know. I don't even think it... I don't even know Best Buy is even relevant. Like, do we even know for sure that it even happened at the Best Buy parking lot? No, we don't know. I think maybe Jay just brought that up because he knew that's where him and her and Adnan used to go a lot. Yeah. The only way we know that Best Buy is even relevant is because of what Jay said. But how are you going to believe anything that Jay said? Like, they took what he said about the Best Buy parking lot and just made a story about it. But, like, that might not even be anything. 
It probably didn't happen in the Best Buy parking lot. Yeah, exactly. I feel like I, I'm thinking of what Jay said is what happened, but no, you can't even believe that. He said it happened at Best Buy parking lot, so that means it didn't happen in the Best Buy parking lot. I mean, she was bar- she was found buried in Lincoln Park. Maybe she she could have been fucking strangled in Link- uh, Lincoln Park for all we know. Well, Jay says that he went to Best Buy and that's where Adnan showed him Hay's body in her car. In the trunk was in the Best Buy parking lot. That's not even but believable like, to me when you, t- when you t- tell me it. But then he changed his story and said, oh, yeah. he actually didn't show me the body there. He actually showed me the body like when we were like by Lincoln Park like, or whatever. I don't even know. I probably got that wrong. Like I I can't track his stories. It's literally so many changes. And like I remember um, Rabia said in one of her interviews, she said like there was a timeline of like the thing that Susan Simpson did when she was pulling up all like the, the cell phone records and stuff. Like there was a timeline of like evidence so she she had the full timeline of all the order in which the police found the evidence corresponded right next to it was the timeline and every change in jay's story and almost every single time when they find a new piece of evidence is when the change happens like almost exactly every single time that's pretty incriminating yeah like it lines up perfectly every time they find something new he has to say he has to somehow explain it so he makes up something new it's it's nuts if go like just thinking in like the future, if he ever gets out of jail and he's found innocent of a crime, like could they go back and like charge those two police officers for corroborating the story? Could that be a thing? I don't or know. Sue I think Jay? it could be, but I think, but I think but Jay, like he probably had like an immunity agreement. Like if he did this testimony, mm-hmm. that he could never go to jail, so he probably wouldn't. I think like even if they found evidence against Jay that he was the one who did it, I don't think he could go to jail if he has immunity from like this case. I mean, I could be wrong about that. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, but I would suspect. Well, I feel like, yeah, because in the documentary, he even, like, he allegedly confesses. Like, we don't hear him say it, but she's talking to him on the phone at the time in the documentary. And she's telling us what he is saying. And he says that he just went along with what the police told him to say. So he admits it. So I feel like... You know, the the documentary probably wouldn't even be allowed to say that kind of thing if it would result in Jay going to jail. Um, So he probably is, like, completely immune. But also, even, I just quickly wanted to go back to, like, the whole story that Jay said and, like, the Best Buy thing. I feel like it's such a convoluted story. Like, he left me his phone and gave me his car so that he could call me late, get a ride with Hay, then call me later from Best Buy, tell me to pick him up. Then we drove to this place. He drove her car. Like... I feel like if you're going to plot a murder, like, wouldn't there be an easier way to do it? Like, why do you have to do all the run, like, roundabout, like, all this shit? Like, I don't know. I feel like it just, it just, it it, it seems so obvious that, like, they were just trying to, like, make it work with the cell phone tower pings. All you could say was, like, meet me at Lincoln Park. This is where I'm going to kill her. I'll call you when I'm done. That's what he, well, that's what he did say in this original story about the Best Buy thing. Like, I'll call you when I'm done. Yeah, but they go into this whole thing where, like, they if he planned yeah. this whole thing, like, you know, why did he plan it so shoddily? Like, wh- like, you know what I mean? Like, why not just make it super clean and way better than how it actually happened? Uh, it does, yeah, it just seems too convoluted to be an actual plan. I was just thinking, like, going back to, like, Adnan being so calm, like, I don't even think I could, could compose myself to be that calm if someone's talking shit about me like that. I don't know, I just hate hate like injustice like i just can't stand when it especially when it's so like glaringly obvious like it's racist Racism. well just like racist racism and like just the, well the criminal justice system in general is just like just like look how easy it was to like take this totally innocent guy and just paint this picture that he's this horrible person who killed his ex-girlfriend like and there was so many other people who knew hey too it's like so like why couldn't it be somebody some one of them like why did the specific- well, could have been like, it could have been eight million people like it could have been someone she knew it could have been some random stranger like we said earlier yeah. like, like it's just Since I don't it's just it was crazy. a high crime it was a high crime rate area so it could have been fucking anybody in the area yeah but that would have been hard to prove that it was some rando off the street right so it was easy to you know ma- manipulate Jay into saying what they needed to hear it was just way easier they just didn't yeah, want to do the yeah, job. Like- you know their easier route yeah like the easiest way was just to be like we're gonna take this guy and manipulate him and get the story we want versus spend years but then also i feel like wasn't there like a, they said there was like a serial killer in baltimore around the same time or mm-hmm. something oh yeah some guy got out like weeks or days before hay was murdered like he, yeah from 
I don't I forget what what charge it was, but yeah, he just maybe it wasn't jail. a serial killer, but yeah, like he was in jail for something else and then he got out a couple days before she went missing and it was like a similar like yeah, it was wasn't like a similar, similar demographic. It was like another Asian woman or something that he had killed or that something. That was strangled or something. I maybe yeah. I'm like stretching there, but it was something that was like, Holy fuck, like this could have been the same dude. I don't I'm like why do it in the middle of the day too? And maybe to, so he has an alibi like he's back at school, but it just feels like I don't know. Why do it on your break before after school and you know you know you have like a half an hour and if it wasn't planned like i don't i don't know it's just it doesn't yeah and also too like it's just weird like yeah why do it at that like he and hey were pretty close like he would have had a million opportunities we could have just been like hey we need to like talk we need to meet at this plate right like and she probably would have gone like if she trusted him right so like why did he feel like he had to do it like right there in the best buy parking lot at 236 broad daylight like in between tra- like the end of school and track practice like i don't know i just feel like there's a million other opportunities that would be way less sketchy if he was actually gonna plan this yeah and like the thing is like when they question people it's like things that jay said are true but they didn't happen like the way that jay no. said they did or why they happened the way jay said they did like they're talking on the phone and like yeah, adnan's like super sketched out it's not because of that you know what i mean it was like a, maybe it was a different day but they kind of like all just clump it into this one huge thing when it's really not everything's all well, also, separate well, yeah, it's just crazy that like if you think adnan didn't do it at all and jay was able to make this whole story out of all these different events that had happened even if it wasn't even the same day or if it didn't have anything to do with anything you know they kind of all they just made it a part of the story mm-hmm. whether they're trying to confuse everybody just to, like i don't know so as an advantage to them but fuck it worked no one knows what the hell's going maybe on. We're, maybe we're all just super uh, naive and think that he didn't do it in reality he actually did he's the biggest sociopath we've ever known no oh. I don't think there's I don't think there's a, a chance I, even, I don't think there's even like a slim chance I don't know I don't think he did it I don't know I think it's impossible I mean I guess I can't say impossible because anything is possible but I'm very adamant that he is innocent but yeah, he had the chance to plead guilty and take a deal and be out of jail in four years. In yeah. either 2018 or 2019, but he didn't. He just didn't take it. He kept saying that he's innocent, so he didn't get that deal. Yeah, like if if you think about it, if you just just say for one second that he is guilty, and he's in sitting in prison and he's guilty and he's he knows that he did it and he's thinking, okay, I'm going to be in the jail for the rest of my life for this crime that I know I did. And then they come to him and they say, okay, well, we're going to get you out in four years. If you just admit that you did it. And then instead of being in jail for life, you're just going to be in jail for four years. If you were guilty, why wouldn't you be like, okay, of course I'm going to take it. Like, I'm not going to be in jail forever. Like I'm going to get out in four years. Like I'll do it. Like I think the fact that he denied the plea deal, because it's much more believable that he'd be like, I'm not going to com- uh, admit to something I didn't do. Like if I didn't do it, like it's much more like the reason he would deny it is that he's innocent and he's not going to admit guilt for something that he did. And then it would be on the record that he pleaded guilty. And everyone says, well, if you plead guilty, you did it like you're not going to go down that road. So I think it's like much more plausible that he's innocent and just wasn't going to do that versus like, like if he was guilty, why wouldn't he just like take that four year deal and be like, yeah, peace out in four years. Like instead of being here for like, I don't know. Just imagine that, like, thinking about what in- what to do in that situation, like, what goes through your head. It's like, if you're guilty, you get out, but if you're if you're innocent, you have to stay in jail. Like, you have to make that decision for yourself. It's crazy the way the system works, right? Like, if you admit it, just admit it, and we'll let you go. So it means you're guilty, you can get out. But if you're if you didn't do it, then you're staying in jail. Like, it's just like why? And like, just to make that decision, it's it's crazy. Like, I can't imagine what wasn't going through his head believe they say this in the documentary they did get a couple of wins and original conviction was overturned like once or twice and they said yeah like the evidence was not presented like the fax cover sheet all of that cell phone records and all of that shadiness that went on like they did get the win and then the state kept appealing and appealing and appealing and then eventually it was like the supreme court denied his get a new trial which if he got a new trial i think in this day and age i mean be hard to find jurors who like don't know about this case or anything but like just if we got a new trial, like I think it'd be so much different. I don't know. Who knows how long it's gonna be for Tim to like appeal, like to get a new trial too. Like it might not ever happen. And he's been in jail for you know he went he got arrested when he was seventeen and he's now, you know, thirty nine, turning forty this year. So he spent more most of his life in prison, um, which is sad. Like seventeen years old, I don't know. He had so much 
<clears throat> potentially had so many like plans that he stuff he wanted to do like who knows where he could have been now but fucking system like railroaded him and the criminal justice system like like is it really that hard to find somebody who actually killed her like well well not if you're looking probably not but so that's they were I mean. really like, looking like is the case just closed and nobody's actually looking anymore is it really, like well, no, like, well, the police and stuff—they're not going to look because they think that he did no, it like, and he's in jail. The private investigators, or is there other people that look into these things? Like, yeah, they do. Like, Robbie has had private investigators. Like, she's still uncovering things. Like, it just makes me angry. Like, somebody, there's some someone out there needs to know something, and this guy is like, he's sitting in jail, wasting his life away because of something someone else did. And so frustrating to me. I know, it's so frustrating. Since we're like coming to close to the end here, um, there was something that I read in Rabia's book that I wanted to read in the podcast because I think it's very interesting and it was striking when I read it and I just wanted to pass it along um, in this podcast. So in the book, this is from uh, Rabia's book, uh, The Search for Truth and Justice After Serial, a non-story. In the book, they mentioned that like during their investigation with Susan and Colin while they were doing like the undisclosed documentary and stuff, um, it came up about this quote unquote psychic um, and that she had some very, very interesting information that she wanted to bring forward. Um, turns out that she wasn't actually a psychic. She like worked in finance or something, but um, she just said that she could feel energy or she had like this very, very vivid dream that she was certain was connected to the death of Heyman Lee. She eventually ended up emailing Rabia um, the full like account of the dream that she had, the experience that she had, and I just wanted to read it. So this is from page 346 of the book. Uh, I wanted to document for you what I saw in the fall of 2000 when I co contacted the Baltimore police. In November 2000, I was a sophomore in D.C. and took a Southwest flight from Chicago to Baltimore after Thanksgiving break. As I was about to deplane, I touched a bag in an overhead compartment at the same time as a Korean woman in the plane and felt a jolt of energy. She was in her mid to late 40s, a little plump, 5'2 to 5'6 and maybe 140 to 150 pounds in leather black pants and a tunic type sweater. We didn't talk but the energy was strange and left me buzzing. That night when I got back to my dorm room, I had a terrible vivid dream that disturbed me for more than a decade. I found it so disturbing I shared it with family and a few friends and actually called the Baltimore police to share my vision. I never heard back from them after I reported it. That was the one and only time I've ever contacted law enforcement about a dream or vision. This is what I saw. In a Baltimore motel parking lot off of a busy street with strip malls and big box stores and gas stations, etc., a young Korean girl in her teens or early 20s is in the driver's seat of a car. The car smelled like sex. Not sure if it was consensual sex or not, or if the sex had been in the car or motel, but I didn't get the sense that she had been raped. The car had a cloth interior like the fake crushed velvet kind and was gray silver. I think there was a tape deck. There was junk in the back seat and on the floor, a jacket, paper, receipts, and an empty 7-Up or Mountain Dew bottle, maybe. The girl was afraid, and a young white man in his early 20s or late teens with short, dark blonde hair and piercing blue eyes that were bloodshot and crazed was in the passenger seat leaning over her, choking her with his bare hands. He may have stopped at some point and gotten some kind of cord, like parachute core or a sweatshirt tie. But I'm not sure. It took a really long time or felt like it did. It was awful and she made a gurgling, crackling noise as she choked. There was a minor struggle, but the whole time I could hear her thoughts and she kept thinking, this is crazy, this isn't happening. There was a general sense of betrayal as well as shock and disbelief. She was more shocked than scared and felt so betrayed and just shocked. She didn't fight as hard as she could have, I think because she kept thinking he was going to stop. She didn't believe for a second that he was going to kill her. It was cold out with no leaves on the trees. The heat was on in the car. You could see trees over the fence they faced. It was late afternoon. His thinking was disordered. It was almost nonsensical and manic. He didn't mean to kill her and didn't want to intellectually. I had the sense he was high on drugs or extremely mentally ill. He didn't want to kill her and just couldn't make himself stop. He really wanted to stop but just couldn't control himself. It was terrifying being in, in his head. And he was so out of control and self-loathing while hurting her. It was awful. After she was dead, he cried. He felt horrible and disgusted with himself and didn't know what to do. He got out of the car, which was facing a fence that was chain-link with brown plastic or old brown wood. I'm not sure. 
Behind the car, which was gray, silver, or very light blue, were hotel rooms that were beige, tan, with dark brown door frames and window frames, like a Motel 6 or Econo Lodge. They were parked by a brown dumpster that wasn't full. He put something in the dumpster. It might have been a plastic bag with something in it. I didn't see what it was, but it made a light noise when it landed that sounded like something hard or heavy in plastic, obviously on top of other trash, not an empty dumpster. He opened the trunk that was also carpeted, cloth, and had a dark blue or black duffel bag in it. It was late afternoon, and the sun was already setting before he killed her, and he waited till just after dusk. There was basically no foot traffic or other cars. He moved her body to the trunk, folded her almost in half on her side to fit her around the duffel, and drove her to his mother's house. He didn't know what to do and drove around before taking her there, but didn't know what else to do. He wasn't scared about being caught. He was just unable to think coherently. He may have lived there too, I'm not sure, but it was definitely his mother's home. He went inside and left her in the trunk. He didn't decide to leave her there, he just did it, which chilled me. No one else was home. When he entered the house, he started to sob and shake uncontrollably. There were crosses in the house and maybe a picture of Jesus with a sacred heart. He felt intense guilt and remorse. He knew he was going to hell and this scared him very much. His mother was very Christian and he was terrified of her knowing what he had done. He went up the stairs and there were family pictures on the walls and maybe the landing on the way up. The carpet was worn and either dark gray or brown maybe. Walls were lighter. He went into his dark room, didn't turn on the light, and fell asleep crying with terrible nightmares. I don't know what happened next and I didn't see the burial clearly, but he buried her with his bare hands, not a shovel, and he was wearing gloves. The ground was hard and there was a big mound of dirt like a mined patch or a construction site nearby. He was alone when he buried her in late afternoon. It was sunny and very cold. He said a prayer over the grave before he left her. He felt genuine sadness and remorse. He may have left a jacket or sweater on her. There was a red jacket too, either in the car or the grave. Then I stopped seeing and feeling him and could feel the dead girl. She was in cold, shallow ground. It was a wooded area near a creek or small area of flowing, not stagnant water. But there wasn't much of it. It was frozen over. It was slightly below her, and she was on a, bl a bank closer to a path or road with the water on the other side of the log. There were frozen and snowy leaves on top, and she was near a rotten log that had been there at least a year, possibly longer, that had moss on it. There was a used condom on the ground nearby and some other trash. I didn't see any liquor bottles, though. You could hear traffic muffled and also trees rustling. It smelled like motor oil and moldy leaves. She was sad and worried about her mother who didn't know where she was. She could hear her mother crying, and it made her sad and lonely. I could hear a bell of some kind ringing and saw the letters S and D or T. I'm not sure which. I have no idea what they mean. I felt like she was crying and so sad about her family, not knowing where she was. She felt worried and alone and betrayed. So, what do you guys think of that? It's eerie how you can just, like, picture that what happened and, like, it, it just... A lot of the things like line up with what we know happened, like with the gravesite and the burial. It's super weird. Yeah, especially like des describing like the person who did it. it. Like if you have if you've seen the documentary, they show a picture of Don. It kind of like looks like him. It just like the way she's describing it. Anyway, it's weird. Very weird. Yeah, like like a white guy in his early twenties. With like shorter blonde hair, blue eyes, like kind of like. Um, she saw the letters uh, D, S, and T, and his name is Don Kleindinst. Like all those letters are in that name. Like the wooded area that's like described is very similar. But I also think like he lived, like he lived. Did Don live with his mother? I mean, she was his manager at the store, so maybe he lived with her. That's also weird too. If she did. I don't know. Was she Christian? Was he Christian? Like that would be good information to know. And also, it fits in like with the thing of like. So he killed her, put her in the trunk of her car, and then he went and fell asleep at home. And then he buried her like when it was like it was during the day that he buried her again, which would have been the next day because she said it was like the sun was setting. Like when he was when he was like putting her car, her body in the trunk, like it, the sun was setting and then he was burying her during the day. So that would have been like 24 hours later, which would have fit with like the lividity theory. Like it had to at least eight to 12 hours later. So it could have been 24 hours like that fits with that theory. Right. It's just like so vivid and like just so I don't know. I just wanted to like read that and put that in there because it's like, and like she's like she says she's like adamant and she swears that it's like connected. Like it's like so detailed too, and it was like an Asian or it was like a Korean woman, 
like around the same age and like manual strangulation like she's saying like the person strangling them with bare hands it's manual strangulation like all of the details like seem like they line up like like Don she says it's like, like a white man and like that's not adnan I bet you everyone who was listening to that was like picturing it as I was reading it. Like you could like see, I don't know. It was just like very vivid and very detailed. I feel like you could and just like was, see it. And, it, and this, uh, this is like probably going to be really far fetched, but if it was during Ramadan, they fast. So like, if it was Adnan, he might have been like really hungry and like really weak. You know what I mean? Though like, it's a very, it's a very long stretch, but like. If you have any no, food. it's true though. Like at, they they talked about how he, at track practice, like he wasn't allowed to run track during Ramadan really because he hadn't eaten all day, and if he ran, mm-hmm. he might pass out. So I mean, he probably would have been weak. I don't know how much effort it takes to strangle someone. I've, and I've never done it, but um, I imagine you'd have to have a little but, bit of strength. Yeah, yeah, like, and, and and if she was putting up a fight, and she was athletic too, like this yeah, is someone who would like to be up, very. And if she was putting up a fight, and like scratching them, and like whatever she did to like try to get him to stop doing what he was, they were doing but yeah it is super vivid when you read it and like you can picture exactly how it happened and that's kind of like how when things are unfolding kind of like how i would picture things hmm. but um and like, and she's, like she, she, oh go ahead coincidences like just how things line up it's just it's really hard to believe that this came out of nowhere for this woman yeah and it's like and she, yeah like she said like she, she said she contacted law enforcement which she never does like obviously she had to feel very very strongly that i don't know it was connected and somehow but i don't know you just picture it's like if hey saying like yeah she has she has to do something before she goes and meets up or gets her cousin like if she was meeting up with dawn and like they described the hotel room like i don't know i feel like it could be very possible like she was meeting up with dawn after school and like just obviously never made it there because if he strangled her i don't know like allegedly of course then what would his (laughs) then what would his motive be though if it was him i don't know like i can't think of him i don't that's the thing is like we don't know much about don really throughout all of this so like i can't say like what i just feel like like maybe she said something about adnan that he was like pissed and jealous or like or had a rage like maybe he just snapped i don't know maybe okay. she yeah and we do know from the documentary that he's like really ill now and like he doesn't expect to live past 50 and he's probably like 40 something now so maybe he was even sick back then and on meds and you know just like that were like messing with his head allegedly like i'm not saying that this person like this woman's like vision is like you know testimony like it's not obviously would never be testimony in in court but i'm just saying like if it did happen similarly to that and he did go he put her in the trunk and then he went home and fell asleep but like does that really fix go with his alib like he was at work wasn't he or i guess if they if they fudged that it wasn't actually like if someone forged his time card to like show up that he wasn't actually at work he wasn't at work i think that's the thing like that's why they forged it so that you oh, yeah, would have an alibi saying he yeah, wasn't. So it, he actually wasn't, though. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's like, I don't know. When I just read the, the letters, like, D, S, and T. Like, I don't know. Obviously, who knows what that means. It could be freaking anything. But, like, I don't know. His name has all those letters in it. I don't know. <laughs> Although, so, so do a lot of other names, too. But, obviously, when you say, like, it's a psychic or she felt this energy, like, it sounds kind of, like, kooky or whatever. But, I don't know. If I just saw that on, like, some random website, I'd be like, okay, this person just, like, wants to feel involved in the case or something. But, like, the fact that, like, Rabia put it in her book and, like, felt the need to, like, actually put the full email there. I feel like Rabia's done so much on this case and she knows so much that, like, obviously if she felt compelled and she believed this woman, then, I don't know, I felt that it was worth mentioning. Find out that it wasn't, wasn't a non, and they find out it was Don, let's say, by the time they figure that out, he'd be dead. So it's like justice is not going to be really served because he's no longer living yeah we have like the injustice from hey like she's never going to get justice because her, her murderer is not actually in jail and then obviously for adnan the justice yeah. where's the justice i don't see it and then there's like that it's also too about the people that you put in that they elect in like those jurisdictions to like yeah. reopen the trial like the people that who are like like that stupid asshole from the documentary and he's uh I don't know An his idiot. Twitter, his his, <laughs> his his Twitter bio bio says justice for all, which is ironic. Yeah, he's super hell bent and again at against Adnan. Like he even took on the case pro bono after it wasn't even his job anymore to do it. Like lay off, bud. Like why is it so personal to him? Like it's it's like I was right the first time and I'm gonna prove that I'm still right. It's just like get over it. 
Oh my god, I know. And, and like, don't they make the case in the documentary that like, he just wants the fame because it's like a w- yeah. high profile case and he just mm-hmm. wants to be associated with it? Yeah, he's not even a prosecutor anymore. And I said it's unheard of for like a um, a lawyer that's not no longer a prosecutor to take on a prosecution case pro bono. Like, this doesn't happen. And yeah, he probably just wants does want the fame. And it's Tiki's ego, too. I think it's like nobody can say that I did it wrong. So I'm going to make sure that I, I stick to this. I follow Rabia on Twitter. And actually, just the other day on the 23rd of February, she tweeted, Every couple of weeks, I learned something insane about Adnan's case that I didn't know before. And guys, I just can't wait for the day when we can finally lay all the crazy out. The investigation continues. So there's even more stuff that like we don't even know at this point. Like, that's it's still going to come up. And then she says, hashtag free Adnan and fuck at Thoreau for Baltimore, which is like that guy. <laughs> so it's just that's so crazy to be like, like, like a, I don't want to say a simple murder. Well, kind of like a simple murder. And like nobody can fucking figure out what happened. <laughs> yeah, but maybe if they dug a little deeper, they could. Like, you know what I mean? They just stuck to one person. I know. Out how, to, how to get him convicted and that's what they did and maybe if they would have spent more time on any other path ever they would have you know been able to actually do it correctly yeah so it's not like a case of like a matter of it's so hard to solve this case and like it just went cold it's like no it went cold because they stopped looking it probably would have been a very straightforward like case that was solved very easily if they actually did the work that they would do in like lots of other cases the evidence was probably like right there in front of their face but if they're not looking for it they're obviously not going to find it it just frustrates me that they just pick this one person to focus on when there could have been like a hundred other people to focus on i don't know it just it's like i don't know it makes me so angry i don't even get it like i don't understand why people just pick this one person and they focus on it. like fucking pick like person you goddamn interviewed 50 yeah, like, times, thousand different stories and in the documentary they said like if they um add on never does get exonerated or whatever they have like this whole list of other people that they can't they could have followed up on and that they should follow up on if they need to so it's like not like there's they don't have somebody else like oh who did it there's like a whole list of people that are on their radar or that should have been and now it's like there's so if they didn't preserve lots of evidence it's like now they're so far gone like witnesses could like you know possible suspects could have died or like you know they evidence is like thrown out so like now it's gonna be even harder and harder to actually solve it but I think at this point, it's like, I just want to add on to get out of jail. And I mean, obviously, I want them to find the real person who did it, but I want him to get out of jail. And if when he does get out of jail, like his life is still not going to be normal because he's spent like half his life in jail and doesn't, he has to get like eased back into the community and trying to find a job when you're a convicted murderer. It's not something easy. Yeah. So it's really a fucked up case. And in this podcast we do t- stories about like people who kill their their loved ones or their family members and like this one might not necessarily fall right into that but i mean he was convicted of killing his ex-girlfriend even though we don't think he did it so it might not fall into our theme directly but kind of indirectly we we make it work there's not, yeah. no, nothing solid that leads, no. leads to him at all not one thing like he sh- should not have been even if like play devil's advocate even if he did do it like there's no way there's enough evidence to convict like it's a very weak case from the prosecution like maybe your star witness shouldn't be someone who changed their story 18 million times like if that's your star witness and like it's not a solid case but it also, worked also he should have got a fucking better defense t- attorney too it's just kind of yeah, it was just kind of like this whole perfect storm of like all of this shitty things that happened like the prosecution was after him and they were horrible and then his own defense attorney was horrible and then like all of the and the sad part is, is that if he ever does get out like and his dad like went into a deep depression she said like in the documentary because he's just so like torn up inside about what happened yeah and it's also sad to think of all the other people that are wrongfully convicted but don't have that support that adnan had to kind of like rally up all this evidence and people Mm -hmm. for him so just think about other people sitting in jail that have no hope of ever you know getting that second chance yeah like the the one silver lining i guess of this case was that like serial did it focused on it and made it such a huge thing so like you have all these people coming forward who are trying to help and like new lawyers who are coming on the case and like all of this there's so much out there on this case now that at least it's like at least people know about it and it's easier to obviously advocate for someone who people know about so because that's like the one silver lining if there is one it's really sad so that just about does it for this case um as you can tell very 
interesting, frustrating, annoying, unjust, every adjective that you can think of. We talked a lot about the different like sources that we've used for this or the different things that we've watched and read. So of course, if you want to know more about this case, and like I said at the beginning, there's other podcasts and stuff that go into the minute details of every single aspect of this case. It's very fascinating to listen to. Um, so definitely listen to the Serial podcast if you haven't. That's kind of where it all starts. And then there's the Undisclosed podcast with Rabia Chowdhury, uh, Susan Simpson, and Colin Miller, which is kind of like a you know a follow-up podcast to Serial. And then there is the HBO documentary, The Case Against Adnan Syed. Uh, so definitely check that out. And then also, I really encourage you to read Rabia's book, uh, Adnan's story, the search for truth and justice after serial, because it kind of goes well with the documentary. A lot of stuff that's in the documentary is also in this book, but the book also has a lot of new information and digs really deep into like um, Adnan's like family history and like the religion and stuff. So it's really interesting to read that obviously we couldn't cover it all in this podcast. And obviously go ahead and uh, you can follow Rabia on Twitter if you want to like get updates of the case because she's always updating at Rabia Squared. And also you can use the hashtag free Adnan um, if you want to get in on the conversation and advocate for him and the people who are working on this case because there's still it's still going and there's still lots of updates that are probably still to come if you know we get good news or good updates so hashtag free Adnan you can follow us on Instagram at crime family podcast you can follow us on Twitter at crime family pod one and the awesome music that you're hearing throughout this podcast is done by the awesome Tim Monis and you can follow him on Instagram at Tim Monis which is at T-I-M m-o-n-i-s um so that just about does it so um thank you so much for listening to us and uh we'll see you next time